At least one linguistic example in your minds, this is not quite the two sentences that um, Emily was talking about, has some different constructions in it. Most cats that we have studied don't admire children whose dogs bark. It's just an excuse to get a few phenomena into that structure, relative clauses, um, some negation, some machine. We'll come back to this sentence in a little bit. But you can see that I have um, the same uh, um, abbreviatory convention that Emily was showing you. When we, when we see NP on the screen here, that's really one of those little box feature structures with a head value verb and a specifier that is uh, empty and a composite that's empty. It's the, it's the typical description. And I'm just um, using a mechanism within the grammar's machinery that says, whenever I see that feature structure and I know you're trying to print a parse tree, then replace that complicated set of stuff with one or two letters. Just so that I can quickly look at this. If I had to have those feature structures in every node, I would need an even bigger screen than I have at home. So um, this is a way of looking at larger linguistic objects efficiently. I can click on these, at least in the actual system, um, and look at the real feature structure. And we'll do a little of that uh, right toward the end if I leave enough time. Um, so this is, this is a tree that was generated by the grammar that I've been implementing. Um, and it conveniently looks quite a bit like the trees that you saw uh, that uh, Emily was putting, putting up. Uh, you, you saw some elegant looking semantics, uh, well elegant, it was the feature structures that Anne showed uh, in this formalism that is something like minimal recursion semantics. Uh, I was going to show you a beautiful looking dependency graph which everybody on the planet can understand, but instead I didn't get around to that. And so you're looking at a kind of abstraction that says that sentence introduces a number of these predications, a number of these relations. Um, and I have um, put them in, in uh, one line, one per line instead of in nice boxes, but you might be able to figure out, and especially if I give you a little bit of help here, that um, that uh, entry introduced by cat um, shows up in a few places. It's the object of study, uh, it's the thing that's possessed by the child, uh, it's the thing that the uh, uh, um, yeah, it's the thing strangely which is admiring the child, or in fact it's inside of negation. But it, that word has several roles, and part of the task of doing this grammar is to put that set of words together into phrases and arrive at this computed semantic interpretation, all through this magic step of unification. I'm just doing those identity constraints a thousand times over, lots and lots of identity constraints, to arrive at what just looks like a pretty normal representation once you get to the kind of messy formalism that we're using here in the semantics. Thank you. Somebody's coughing back there. Um, <laughs> so uh, here's just one thing to point you to that we are interested in in this kind of larger grammar implementation. In most implementations or most descriptions, you say, okay, let's set scope aside because it's messy. Actually, scope is really important. Semantic scope. That is, um, how much does this negation operator have con concern itself with, and what are the things that are in that sentence are not within the scope of negation? How much is being denied? Well, part of the task of, of writing this is to find, is to make sure we record that it's only the admiring situation or event or predication which is being negated. There is some studying, there is some barking, um, it's just that there isn't admiring of the particular type that we're talking about. And so that um, mechanism in here is, explains how we talk about uh, scopal operators, there is a way of accommodating it. Uh, it's described in somewhat agonizing detail in the introduction to minimal recursion semantics, which we'll point you to. I think there's reference in the, in the bibliography. All right, now to turn to uh, um, some characterizations about the grammar. We use that notion of a type hierarchy um, uh, to an extreme degree. I have about 7,000 types. Um, organized in, in a complicated hierarchy that I can never put on the screen here, although I'll show you a little window in, uh, into a part of that hierarchy in a moment. Um, there are 975 leaf types, that is, um, the actual different parts of speech that are in the grammar. I have a different part of speech for the verb give because it takes two NPs, or it has a data shift variant of it. That's a different lexical type than the one for persuade, which takes a noun phrase and a verb phrase. And that's different from the entry for turn, as in it, it turned out to be true that, um, where uh, turn takes an it expletive subject and a particle out, and then a verb phrase of some kind, or a, a full sentential complement. Not very many lexical entries that populate that particular type, but it's there. It's one of the ones in the grammar. That might give you a reason, some motivation, or some indication of why I need 900 of them. And I'm not just doing verbs, of course. I have about, uh, I don't know, 
30 or 40 uh, types just for the verb be in all of its many incarnations for the inflected forms for singular and past and subjunctive and the there copula. There's just an annoying number of verbs be. So um, some of those lexical types have only one or three or ten instances in all of the English lexicon, and some have thousands and thousands, like the, the type for ordinary common nouns is rather well populated. I have taken the trouble to describe or write down 39,000 or so um, of these lexemes, the basic ones, um, mostly trying to capture the ones that I can't depend on a kind of vanilla part of speech tagger to figure out for me. If I'm pretty sure the part of speech I can say, that's a common noun, that's a transitive verb, that's an adjective, I'm not going to put those entries into my lexicon because it takes me too long to do it, and the machine, that, that automated process is pretty good. For English, there are pretty good part of speech taggers. So I'm basically filling in all of the things like the entry for the verb turn, as in it turned out to be true that X. Um, that entry is not going to come from a part of speech tagger. Not no chance, I think. Or at least I haven't found a way to train one that would do that. Here's where I, uh, up to that point, I'm kind of well within the sphere of pure um, HPSG a la uh, the last millennium. Um, but then I started sliding down this slope of uh, adding to that canonical seven syntactic phrase types, the head specifier, head complement, head modifier, the ones we pray to every night in front of the mirror, um, I've, I've added a lot more. Um, still not a crazy amount, not like the tens of millions that would have been produced in a generalized phrase structure grammar of the early 1980s. I'm holding myself to a rather modest 225 rules. Um, that's still pretty many for anybody who does sort of pure HPSG. There's a sense that I'm missing some generalizations, and it's possible. I'll show you a few of those rules a little bit later. I also have a um, slightly richer approach to morphology than Emily showed you from the Sagwas <laughs> Vendor book. I do care a little about morphology since I'm trying to run a real parser, a generator over real data. Um, but I'm still only at about 70 rules for both inflection and derivation. There's a lot of derivational morphology I should still do that I haven't, because I can run away from that to a large extent by just pouring more entries, hand-built entries into the lexicon. I can duck complicated questions about uh, the T-I-O-N uh, suffix for turning verbs into nouns, which is pretty semi-productive, but with all kinds of exceptions and weirdnesses, and I, I don't know how to do it. And so I just put in those words as if they have nothing to do with the verb that they came from. And then finally, we have a, 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 a kind of concession to what everybody else in computational linguistics is doing, namely statistical processing. I thank them for all of their decades of work and use a parse selection model that's trained on hand annotated data. At the very end, I'll show you if I allow enough time a way of annotating data using the grammar to produce training material which we can then use to construct a, a model, a statistical model, which does a pretty good job of predicting the obvious parts, the one you would have expected to see for a particular string of English. It works um, a lot of the time. Not perfectly. And then in terms of scale, all of that uh, 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 noise in the grammar gets me to a point where I can tell you something about more than nine out of every time. In fact, I can tell you every single thing about more than nine out of ten sentences in the Wall Street Journal that is used in the pen tree bank. This ancient 30-year-old corpus of a million words of text from uh, the time right uh, before, no, right after the San Francisco earthquake in 1989. Um, and while uh, uh, Bush number one was a president. I mean, it's a weird dinosaur time. Um, that's the data we talk about in the Penn Tree Bank in this data set. And those sentences all have interesting things in them, and I have slowly with a uh, chisel and sledgehammer and diamond cutting tool been trying to figure out how to adjust the grammar to capture good defensible analyses with the right syntax and semantics for those sentences. It's not the only thing I do, but I spend way too much time looking at that old text to look for examples. Um, as I said, um, we have, I have reflexes of those canonical seven rules which were present back in the Pollard and Sog uh, uh, core text, uh, the core text, but the core uh, reference book from 1994, which you should all at least know about if you are interested in HPSG, has been <coughs> supplanted and improved upon a lot, but there is still a lot of the classical structure from that uh, classical 23 years ago uh, that is preserved in this, in this grammar because I started about in that year working on and some things don't change fast. Here's some examples, though, of what's more fun, more recent, more interesting about constructions that I've added to the grammar to handle um, 
relative clauses, compounds, and so on. These are places where the idea of pushing it as does combinatory categorical grammar all into the lexicon just seemed to use a technical term, wacky. Just ridiculous. <laughs> to note the notion that I should build another lexical entry for the verb try, which is going to project something which looks like it's a regular noun fragment, a, a sentence with a gap in it, and then turn that, make that be only useful for modifier relative clauses in case there is no that. Just, it's dumb. Um, you end up with really just way too many lexical entries floating around in your, for your parser to consider when it's building structures. You lose the notion of efficiency entirely. Likewise for compounds and appositives. Who in that, in that construction is going to say the meaning of Kim Smith and the meaning of an ancient language specialist is a notion of something like identity? doesn't come from any normal entry for any of those words. So I'd have to choose one of those guys, let's say either specialist or Kim, and say, I'm going to build a copy of that, whose only job is to build exactly the same thing, but then get ready to be a modifier in an apposition construction. Like I said, wacky, just not a good idea. There are other places, like in this interleaving of complex complements and adjuncts, where um, I should be more kind or more generous, or at least admit that I'm being um, lazy here. I find it convenient to use constructions as a way of changing the order in which complements picked up. So um, a book was given by Kim to Sandy, and a book was given to Kim by Sandy. To phrase first or by phrase first? In the parsing, the framework that we work in, I have to tell the parser what order to put things in. The verb give, the passive verb, um, has to say either I want the by phrase first or I want the to phrase first. It has to make a commitment, and then I have to do something else in order to get the ordering to be um, varied. I could do that with a lexical rule. I could do that with um, um, some other magic the, of, the, of the kind that Emily was describing with order domains or some kind of scrambling. Some other device which is something other than just unification. But I'm trying to live with just that unification as my main engine, main operation, and trying to keep down my number of lexical entries, and so here's a place where I pushed off into the syntax. So this place is dubious. Here's one where, again, I think it's dumb to think of having a lexical entry for a lexical rule that creates a verbal gerund, because you still have to build exactly the whole verb phrase with an adverb in front and a, an ordinary noun phrase complement that nouns don't usually take as a complement. And, the, and then you end up with that thing saying, oh, now that you're all done, actually, that's just a noun phrase. That's a verbal gerund noun phrase. Seems foolish. Rob Maloof, I think, made a very nice articulation of how silly that was in contrast to nominal gerunds, like the noisy slamming of the door is what bothered me. In the noisy slamming of the door, everything looks like a noun phrase. Noisy is an adjective, not an adverb. Of the door is a prepositional phrase, the kind of thing you expect a noun to take as a complement. So the nominal gerund should be an, a lexical rule, I think, um, and not the verbal gerund. That should be a syntactic rule. This means I end up having a lot of rules that are doing relatively narrow, relatively specific things. Um, I stopped apologizing for that about 22 years ago. Here's a feature structure in teeny, teeny print. Those of you with really great eyes or look at a look around your corner can see um, that those features look pretty much like the ones that Emily was describing. Some slight differences in, very, in, in uh, abbreviatory conventions. Um, and two ugly features down there, dash, dash, min, and dash, dash, s, n, that I couldn't figure out how to hide. Um, but they're not there. Pretend they're not there. Um, here I have a, a description of a transitive verb, something like chase. Um, and uh, as you can see, it has an opinion about not its specifier. I have a specifier attribute there, and I have a slightly ugly engineering solution entry in there, an anti sinsen. This is a, an expression that you will never get to find. It's convenient to treat verbs as having an object specifier because Prepositional phrases like to, like to modify things before the specifier has been picked up. And they can modify nominal phrases, and they can modify verb phrases. So this lets me get a kind of pseudo-generalization, preserve one about the kinds of things that PPs can modify, but by ending up having a funny entry in there. What I think about transitive verbs is they really take a subject. They have a subject and a complement. And I don't try that further compression of elegance that is done in Sagwa Sobender, where everything is either a specifier or a complement. You can uh, admire that slide uh, uh, later on. You'll have a copy of it. Here is a little glimpse into the type hierarchy, those 7,000 types that I was bragging about or mo moaning about. Um, this is a little picture of um, some of the subcategorization frames, the expressions for adjectives. You can see that there are um, ordinary one-arb attributive adjectives like happy or tall. 
Um, I have VP compliment uh, adjectives like um, uh, easy to talk to Sally uh, with an expletive in subject. I have um, uh, transitive adjectives that take uh, PPs, so um, uh, angry at Bill, uh, concerned about X. These adjectives take a particular preposition they care about it. It's probably contentful, but they have an opinion about which specifier they want to show up with. Um, there are uh, subject raising specifiers. There's a bunch. So adjectives aren't as uh, varied in my universe yet as the 150 or so verb lexical types I have, but there are probably about 70 or 80 different adjectives. They're also richly differentiated in their complement structure. And this is a way that I try to capture some of those generalizations. Generalizations. This is a type hierarchy turned sideways. So I have a notion of an ordinary adjective sinsen, which has some subtypes, and the rest of these guys, then by inference, are not ordinary adjective sinsens, but do something slightly unusual. I have one argument and two argument uh, adjectives. I have uh, tough adjectives that inherit from a few things, the scoping ones. So there are there are some generalizations that I pushed higher up in the hierarchy, which they get inherited by these more specific type, subtypes. And the ones that are out here toward the right, they pour more information in. They add more constraints and differentiate themselves from others. That's this notion of the hierarchy at the lexical type level. Okay, now let's go back to those uh, deities that I mentioned before that I have to attend to each time. Coverage, robustness, so on. Um, so on the coverage domain, here's a quick snapshot with ridiculously too many numbers. This is a picture of what my parser did on, with the grammar on, actually what the grammar did using some parser, um, on uh, a set of about a thousand word, uh, sentences from the Wikipedia from an article on computational linguistics. I don't remember which one, but it's number 13 in my set of 13 different snapshots from that Wikipedia from 2010, an ancient version of the English Wikipedia. So here you can see in this column, uh, sorry, the first column, that's the length of the sentence, the number of tokens, that is, um, bunches of letters with a space between them. Whether they were multi-words or not, I just counted those tokens to give you a rough idea about how long the sentences are. Here's my success rate in finding coverage of the sentences that fell into that span, and you can see I'm pretty good on really short phrases. Um, good for me. You might wonder why I don't get all of them. There's some strange things in the Wikipedia. Um, <laughs> at, the, at the 5, 10, 15, 20, up to 25 words, I'm at my good threshold of more than 9 out of 10 sentences. I give you a good analysis for it. And then it starts to tail off and gets a little bit thin up there in the higher air. Uh, that 70 word sentence, the engine that I'm using right now just turns up its nose and says, too many tokens. Whatever you did, however hard we worked at that, the chances you're getting good analysis are zero. So let's just not bother you to try. So I get great efficiency on that one, but not much in the way. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see that we sort of run between. And here in this column, you can see how many analyses the parser found on average for the sentences that were of that length. So short, short phrases, not too many, already at 10, I'm up to 42 analyses on average, different possible ways of applying the rules of the grammar and the lexical entries, and it climbs up pretty quickly to about 500, and from then on it goes, the sky is the limit. Um, there are, there's a little game going on up now between me and Woodley Packard, who is the implementer of the parser of the day, the one I'm using at the moment, the fastest one I can find. Um, and he's good at mathematics and uh, got a master's at Stanford and cheerfully calculates for me after I parsed the long sentence how many different analyses the grammar would have given. And it's in the trillions for some sentences, that is a one with, uh, I don't know, 12 or 15 zeros, who cares. So we're trying to see do I get any that go above 30 zeros or 40 zeros. Um, and at some point he says, you know, 64 bits is not really enough to count that. I need a bigger machine. Um, so the, the, the number of analyses that English allows in principle with a reasonable grammar is huge. Probably I've got a little bit of leakage there. There might be some that, some that I could get rid of, uh, but there are a lot. Let me give you a little picture of that. So here is the, uh, a, a scatter plot of the ambiguity for sentences. This is again by sentence length up to that, that cutoff at 70. Um, and here's the number of analyses that I produce. And you can see that the general shape is a, an exponential curve going very much the wrong direction. It's shooting up there into the stratosphere. I have put a black cloud over the top of my saying, just stop at 500 for the moment. I don't want to draw a complicated picture, so I capped everything at 500. And then you can see that there's some really nice guys that come along out here that aren't that ambiguous and are really long. Um, that's, uh, that's because if they were as ambiguous as those guys, I would never have parsed them. So I find the ones that I can sort of find a reasonable number of analyses for, not too many. 
and I can complete my analysis before I run out of whatever time limit I have imposed. Here's a picture of efficiency. Um, this is uh, the number of, as you, you'll be surprised to hear, the number of seconds, not milliseconds, not microseconds, actual seconds on the clock while I'm waiting for my coffee to get cold, where um, this is the length of the sentence, again up to 70. So up to about 20 words, I can do this within about a second. So a thousand milliseconds, it's still a lot of time. I'm chewing up lots of CPU resources in order to do all of those identity constraints that Emily was describing, thousands of times over exploring an exhaustive search path to discover every possible analysis so I can rank them to find the one that I thought you meant. Um, it's an expensive way of solving the problem. Incremental parsing would be great. Top-down parsing would be wonderful. I'm waiting for those to be invented to use with the kind of grammar I've built. But in the meantime, I pay the cost of just throwing more CPUs at the problem. So in Oslo, Stefan Erpen gives me 10,000 CPUs. They're all pretty fast. Um, Woodley only gives me 100 when I go visit up in, in Seattle, in Bellingham, so I more often go to Oslo in order to get work done. Um, and, and I can go through a pretty large corpus pretty fast, even though I don't have the most efficient, in fact, I think I may have one of the least efficient grammars on the planet. Okay, um, last slide, and then I want to show you a little bit of a demo. The, to come back around, once I have built this implementation, I can find things in a corpus that I can find instances of particular phenomena almost trivially because I've taken the trouble to build those specific constructions, specific lexical types. So even though a positives are just lots of strings of nouns, uh, my, uh, 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 my brother, the famous architect from Seattle, who there's no such brother, um, he's actually a <laughs> business major. Uh, uh, that, those, that, that sequence of noun phrases, it's hard to say, show me all the appositives that are in the Wall Street Journal. It's very hard to find an annotation other than maybe the one done in the Penn Tree Bank, where they did it all by hand, to show you that. And then if you want to go to the British National Corpus, nobody's done it like they did for the Pantry Bank, so you're kind of stuck, unless you have somebody else giving you a dependency parser, which is simulating what I'm doing here. I can find multi-MP coordination. I can find, of course, long-distance dependencies. Of course, we can do that. Free relative constructions. A lot of these just don't have single keywords that you could look for that will trigger the presence of that construction. Relative clauses, famously mostly not visible if you don't have a relative pronoun, and English often drops the relative pronoun. Here I can tell you just exactly, out of 100 articles on the Wikipedia, 2,200 of those have relative clauses in them. And then there's, you know, subtypes of relative clauses. I can tell you exactly which ones are which type, because the grammar has told me everything about those sentences. I have rich information about that. This can be useful for uh, if you're interested in a particular kind of yes-no question or relative clause. Yes-no questions aren't quite as hard as some of the others to pick out through other means. So this, what I'm suggesting is the grammar, once it's been applied to a corpus, can then come back and help the linguist do linguistic work. It isn't just about um, going to make money for Google or whoever happens to be paying salaries uh, of the day. Now, let me take you to uh, a couple of quick demos. How much time do I have? Uh, I have Excellent. Good. So I'll take a little time with this. Um, so the first is a place that I would encourage you to go play at yourself. The website for this is uh, not that hard to remember. ERG is the abbreviation for English Resource Grammar. ERG.Delphin, unknowingly spelled with a hyphen because somebody got there before us without the hyphen. Delphin.net. Delphin is the name of the consortium, the um, implementation and theory consortium that many of us in this, uh, several of us in this room work in. Um, uh, an attempt to share pool resources as we work on different grammars and different aspects of the processing and theory side of working in a linguistic framework. Um, it stands for something like Deep Linguistic Processing with HPSG Initiative. It doesn't flow as nice as some things. Um, so erg.delphin.net, um, and then that log, I'd ignore that, it'll come for free. So if you take yourself to that website, you could do it now or later, then it gives you a page where you can try putting in uh, a sentence of English down here. It gives you a few toggles you can set about how you want the system to behave, all outputs, one output, MRSs, dependency structures. Let me show you the kind of dependency structure we would all wish that I had showed you earlier. Uh, if I do try pressing return in this window, does that still give me something? And is it awake? Yeah. Um, so here you can see um, a, another view of that meaning representation that I showed you with that kind of wordy predication per line, um, which looks a whole lot, whole lot more like what you would see from almost anybody else on the planet trying to parse uh, languages automatically now. 
Um, there is uh, the words of the sentence across the, the bottom, and then um, labels on the part of speech and arcs that tell you what the semantic dependency, what the semantic relation is between them. But that is just, I want to emphasize, another view of the semantics you see, which is more like what I showed you in that box on the right. And the box on the left is the world's ugliest parse tree that shows you what the syntactic analysis was. But it's really easy to draw if all you could draw is rectangles um, and not diagonal lines. So this is all HTML and was done relatively quickly, and we've just never bothered to change it at this point. Um, so you can try um, any sentence you like in there. Let me show you um, uh, a, uh, a particular sentence that we have parsed before, um, because I want to show you the other aspect of that, which is this notion of ambiguity. No, it's not there. It's here. Um, so we are now deep in the middle of that annoying Wall Street Journal data set, where there is a sentence from somewhere around the second of the large 24 segments of the Wall Street Journal, where um, the, the author writes in his exciting verbiage, activity was light in derivative markets with no new issues priced. Don't know how many thousand times that was said uh, over and over again. Each time I have to figure out the analysis refresh because I'm looking at each sentence anew, as if it's a new piece of art. Um, what you see across the top is the sentence, and then here is um, the, uh, what are called um, discriminators, discriminants. They are um, uh, labels, names for ways in which the, the analyses of this sentence divide into two groups, the ones that are consistent with what's described in that box and the ones that aren't. So there is, for example, the noun derivative in English, and there is the adjective derivative. As you can say, oh, that was a very derivative piece of work, um, <laughs> meaning I didn't like it very much, and I think I see something like, saw something like it before. And then there's the noun derivative, which is a technical term in stock trading, which I'm sure you all engage in on a regular basis. In this case, we're pretty sure that that derivative is the noun, not the verb. I'm uh, no, sorry, not the adjective. And so I can identify, I can click on that. I will in a moment, just to tell you how this works. And that will throw away out of this parse forest of 520 possible analyses up there, that 520 remaining. That's not the number of seconds till we all die. Um, it's the number of analyses. And if I click on the noun derivative, it says, I will throw out every tree which is not consistent with that. This is a positive constraint. I am lurching my way toward the right analysis of this sentence. I could show you 520 trees, and you could try and find the one you want. That turns out not to scale very well. It's not the most fun way to do annotation. If I want to identify the right analysis for this one, I walk through that process. Let me do that uh, for a couple for you here. Ignore what was on the right. That was from an earlier attempt that I made and then backed out of. So here I've said, I want that to be derivative. I've now cut the analyses just about exactly in half. Not too surprising. Turned out there were two ways to do derivative markets, and nothing else depended on whether that happened. Um, I can do something a little more exciting. I can say uh, that I want that whole first part of the sentence to be uh, a sentence. So I'm, I'm, as a linguist, thinking, what's the analysis I want here? I think I want a kind of uh, absolutive analysis, or a kind of a with market marked absolutive, where with no, with no new issues priced as a modifier of that whole phrase, yeah? So, uh, John, ran home, John ran home, tears streaming down his cheeks. It's a very common construction in English. You say, you build a nice sentence the way you want, and then you describe without the verb be um, the rest of the state. You leave the verb be out for some reason that we just don't quite know. It's how English works. Um, and so I'm saying, yeah, let me make, make, first sure, make sure I get that right. And it turns out that I, was, I have um, two ways of building that structure. I could say, um, as it turns out, activity was while um, things were light in derivative markets. Um, you, that would only, it's an unlikely analysis, but you can see it in something like, um, well, uh, Joe is not actually a very good player of soccer, um, but he is drunk. That is, he is a good player if he's drunk. The phrase, <laughs> he is drunk, works and gets you the right reading, and it's not the same sentence as in he is drunk. It's not saying just dr drunk is predicated, John. It says he is something, elided, in the state where he's drunk. And annoyingly, people aren't very um, consistent about giving me a comma right before that depictive adjective, like they really should, because it would make my parsing a whole lot easier. And so the grammar says, yeah, OK, I see the vocabula B, and I know that 9,999,000 times out of a billion, it's going to be just the regular copula. But every once in a while, I need that depictive. So this extremely scarce. Rule is there any? Well, I don't want that one. I want 
the regular subject head main clause rule. Um, you would not be able to play with this tool much until you got used to the abbreviatory names I have for all 225 syntactic rules. Take you five minutes, you'd have it all figured out. Um, okay, so I've taken care of that, and I'm down to look, 20 trees. Once I know that's a, a full clause of English, um, I've started to really narrow down. It's starting to get exciting. Um, I can uh, say I don't want to know, I know what I want to do with this guy. Um, that price uh, is either, yeah, um, is either the, ad the, the denominal adjective price as in a high-priced uh, consultant, where it's not that somebody priced that consultant, it's like long-legged, uh, long-eared, uh, bright-eyed. There's this funny construction in English where, you know, it's a morphological construction, you put an ed on the end of a noun, and presto change it, it becomes an adjective, um, even though there was no verb involved anywhere. Um, and priced is ambiguous there, because it can be word low priced, but it can also be priced the verb. Um, I'm pretty sure I just want the verb in this case, that guy. And now I'm down to 10, why I'm really making headway. Um, I say, uh, let's use that was to just be the copula was. Um, because there's another reading for light, there's the noun light. So activity was the object which is light that comes streaming into derivative markets. Well, that's not the reading we want here, um, and who would have ever thought of it? It's the machine's fault. So I just want the predicative construction, and then I have I'm down to two, and you might say, what are those two? Well, the word activity, we of course know, is the ordinary mass count noun. But English has this annoying property for conventional writing that you capitalize the first word of a language. And if I say, oh, well, it's always just the way it was without the capital letter, I could never parse grumpy laughed at sneezy, because grumpy is a capital G at the beginning of a sentence. But I want to say, now maybe that's the name of something. Even though it looks like a word of English, it can also be coerced into our proper name, and that coercion gets lost at the front of a sentence because we have another reason to put in a capital letter. So I unknowingly, and again with very little benefit to myself most of the time, make room for that unusual construction to come in. Um, but I say, no, no, this is the ordinary activity, not something weird. Um, and I now have the analysis that I wanted. You might find some things to be surprised about in that structure. Among them, you will see that I show you, unlike Emily's prettier trees, every rule that I apply. So she compressed all of those morphological, inflectional, non-branching, ugly rules that are the truth of the language um, because it doesn't look nice on the slide. Here, the grammar is saying, no, no, lots of things happened to that word priced before it got there. It was a transitive verb that got turned into a passive. Um, and then it got a uh, punctuation mark put on top of it. And then I said, and actually I didn't find the optional by phrase, so I'm going to discharge that guy to make sure I'm saturated, and now I'm ready to be the thing that this with, this very special with for the, for the absolutives can deal with, because it's, again, a binary structure, and I'm building everything one complement at a time. Another thing you might not like, wearing your aesthetic hat, but it's convenient for me to have a single head complement rule that says, don't pick up any arbitrary number of complements, just pick them up one at a time. Just don't be too clever about it. So I end up with this structure, and it has a meaning representation, which I think I can show you. Uh, that would be down here. Um, and again, it's that thing that you probably don't think you want to learn how to read, um, but has um, all of the identities in the right places, I assert, so that we can know what the derivative market relation had to each other. It was, in fact, this compound relation right here, which corresponds to a syntactic rule because I didn't have another entry for market or for derivative that was going to say, I want to be in a compound. It's just the regular noun derivative, the regular market, and then I have a syntactic rule that says sometimes those can make bigger nominal phrases. Bigger nominal phrases. And you see the reflex of that with subordinating relation. That's the one that says, I expect a clause as the thing I'm going to modify, and something that almost is a clause, that has the meaning of a clause inside. Uh, with no, what was it? Um, nothing priced. Um, so the, the uh, semantics comes out as I'd hoped, and what I can do with this work that I've done is record those, what were they, five decisions. So I took a forest of 520 trees, and with some careful, uh, uh, um, I admit, slightly experienced, trained uh, practice, figured out which of those would get me to the tree that I want but I was only picking things that I think you could agree were reasonable given my intentions. I made those five decisions and whittled that tree down to one. I can record those five decisions, and now as I change the grammar, I can reapply those decisions to a new forest from that same sentence with slight differences. Say, what else do I have to do? 
did the grammar over the last six months introduce any new ambiguity that I have to resolve, or am I good? And more, more crucially, I can use those discriminants to then train a model to say, when you see things like this, when you see a sentence like that, and you see a local configuration, try not to do that stupid was with the elliptical be and an adjective phrase following it that isn't its complement. Don't do that one. Um, don't take activity most of the time as a, as, a proper noun, as a proper name, but just use it as activity. Those very unlikely choices, the models say, yeah, about every single time except one or two, I saw that one guy. So I mostly won't give you that analysis unless there was no other way to parse it. So it gives me a ranking, um, or a preference at least, for the frequently occurring constructions. You might rightly guess that I have to do this for quite a few sentences in order to build a model with 225 rules and 39,000 items and a bunch of lexical rules that can do a good job on the Wall Street Journal. Um, and it's true. So I ended up um, with help from some very poorly paid undergraduates, tree banking <laughs> about a million and a half words. Uh, that's about 100 and, yeah, about 100,000 sentences of English where I did those five or 10 or 15 things. With some sentences, it's longer. Um, the, the benefit, though, is that I can, uh, what were you going to say? Uh, Fabiola has a question. Oh, yeah. I have a question for Good. people uh, streaming. In case you've got time for questions. Where yes, I do now. <laughs> where is the punctuation generated? Because it looked like it was generated by a non branch for... It is indeed. So I treat, yeah, maybe I can, you can see it in this tree. I have a, uh, one of these non-branching nodes, will it show to me here? I think it will. Yeah, there's the, the NP transitive verb lexical entry. Here is the conversion to the passive, essentially that very rule that you saw Emily described. And then here is the period rule. So I treat punctuation, most punctuation, as just affixation, consistent with the conventions in English. That's what it is. No one else does this on the planet except for Ted Briscoe, who's a really smart guy in Cambridge. Who, um, uh, uh, I've had useful, fruitful conversations with, um, and Jeff Nunberg, um, who wrote a nice book on punctuation and also said, actually, this is what the way it really should work. If a good linguistic theory came along, it would look like that. So the, the, there, are, there are some places where that makes life a little more difficult. Um, I, I do have to do some pulling apart of punctuation in a pre-processing phase.